Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Deep Weed Podcast. Today, uh, we've got two of your favorite guests back with us, both Doth and Ham Slice. First off, quick shout out to Daniel for the timestamps on the last video. He's now done both the Doth video and the Ham Slice one. So thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, today, all three of us will be answering your questions, some for me, some for Doth, some from Doth to Ham Slice. Uh, and at the end, uh, we'll have one last one in Japanese. Uh, so everybody remembers Doth, who's managed to get good fast past the N1. Doth, thanks so much for coming back on. Yeah, thank you for having me, Kanji. Nice to be here. Yep. And Ham Slice, it's been a long time, but uh, he's come back again. Uh, welcome. Welcome back again. 12 years plus using Japanese, and you're planning to practice law in Japan. Thanks so much for coming back as well. So, meanwhile, I've accumulated 4,000 active immersion hours since 2019, landed a six-month stay in Japan, and worked at a sister tech company uh, to my current company, and now I run a small podcast. So, that's all three of us. Let's go ahead and unzip into this load of questions, Doth, please. Yeah, so I personally had a lot of questions for last time, but sadly they couldn't get covered. So, if, you know, Ham Slice, if you're ready, I'd like to ask some questions about career and education first. Okay. Okay. So first of all, one thing that I'm personally very interested in is what were the challenges that you had to face from, you know, your age at input-based study, anime, visual novels, light novels, into actually studying, you know, law and everything uh, in uni, and also from your conversational Japanese, like I guess in your izakaya by the time, to actually being functional in a working environment. Okay, well for the izakaya, I didn't really have any trouble at first like um i just kind of went like like i said before I, I started streaming so i pretty much just went and did like my streaming level japanese at the izakaya and they were fine with that because it's not like a really strict environment or anything but i found that like you know basic instructions even like you know pretty abstract instructions i could deal with uh you know decently um i didn't actually have any problems until i was in like a more like corporate type of environment like when i was doing like interpretation stuff like that but that's only because um like terms have like you need to use like a specific term otherwise nobody knows what the hell you're talking about type of thing um but aside from that it wasn't too too bad um i think when you're moving from like just input into like output in japanese it's more like um more like just manners and, you know, doing the customary things and just like watching how every, all the Japanese people work and trying to like imitate them. And even then it's still kind of hard, but um, it wasn't that bad. It just, like I said last time, you have to eat dirt sometimes. You have to like make the mistake and you have to like kind of own it and then like take note of that and just slowly, you know, build up uh, your knowledge and your habits of doing it like correctly kind of thing and cool cool yeah yeah uh, i didn't touch on the education one that one was a bit harder than working in an izakaya um the thing that like we do with immersion learning is we just kind of like get tons of input and we let our brain kind of like filter through the information and find like the underlying patterns and then we like you know check grammar or d dictionaries or whatever and then we just like you know we'd be like okay yeah okay that is what it means my senses were right and we just kind of like keep you know inputting I, f I found that um, when I moved into academia, it's not really the same. You know, you can't just you can't just you know like take a sentence with a new term in it and put it in Anki and then be like, "Hey, I know this word now." It doesn't work at all. Um, you kind of have to like you have to know the definition and you have to like kind of know how to use definitions and know how to use words and it's just like a whole process. I'm, I'm sure like anybody who's been to college knows what I'm talking about more or less. It's not like it's not like some big deal, but it just takes a while to get used to. And if you if you have like an immersion type attitude going into it, you might waste a bit of time. Another okay, problem cool. I had was exams and stuff like that. But I think I touched on that last time. Maybe I don't know. I, so to summarize, you yeah. Well, you would say some of these, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> what 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 were the what were the issues you you faced with exam versus like? Oh, what, just what, like um like written exams. It's just like impossible to keep up with native writing speed. You know. Okay. Yeah. It took like uh, it took like like a year of me practicing every day before I could you know write a, a fast enough speed to actually output at 
like like you get like 60 minutes to write like i don't know like 2500 words which isn't bad necessarily but it has to be organized it has to be correct and it has to be in japanese obviously and has to be all the correct kanji so doing that on the spot with no like reference material took practice and output or input like immersion did help but it's not like input equals that you know what i mean you have to actually go out of your way and do it and practice did you deal with that too doth like are you being that you're in school uh, are you having to... no actually at all because my program is in english right oh, okay. and the classes i do have in japanese i would say are mostly conversational like discussion basis uh based and like you can have your reports in english also my lab everyone is japanese besides me so i guess we converse in japanese but i wouldn't say it's hard and i don't think i could do what you know ham slicer did i would say kanken in in a sense would be easier than having to actually write a whole essay in japanese because with kanken is more like a quiz there's like empty spots you have to fill in with right. like just one or two kanji but like to write coherent sentences, I don't think I could do that. In all honesty, so yeah, crazy. So yeah, actually, for that, uh, Hamslash, do you have any tips, especially for like people who aren't in Japan yet, to get used to these before they actually arrive there? You know, the specific words, word usage, or maybe even culture, for example. Um. Mm. Like for academia and career, yes, and professionally. Um, I guess, um, for professional stuff, like it's kind of hard to do because it, you can't. You kind of have to, like, it, obviously, language is like a communication tool, right? Like, what you have to say and how you have to say it depends entirely on the person who's right in front of you. So it's kind of hard to prepare, but just like for like basic stuff, you could just get like you'd start building up like a like uh if you're going to work like a professional job you can start like making a database of like email templates because i know like even natives use templates sometimes because it's just so like it's so rigid just get like templates read them you can mine them if you want um i wouldn't recommend doing mcds with them because just whatever you can just use a template it's fine um but for academic stuff there's not really anything you could do to prepare i don't think you kind of have to be there and get feedback and kind of like do like a back and forth with the actual like professor like you can't go on like hello talk or whatever and be like hey i'm going to go to university um correct me in an academic way because they won't know what, what the hell that even means because it doesn't mean anything necessarily you know it's all like it's all like bit it's time place specific for career and for like academia it's like topics subject specific what are you looking at what what are you what format are you doing like at that time so like the best thing would be to just get more input maybe get some like basic practice work on your like basic core ability and then when you get there don't be afraid to like ask questions or make friends with like your academic supervisor or whatever and just like get really close with people who are capable of teaching you things just okay so very interesting i would say but do you think that you know in relation to this there's actually a higher level of language especially in academics that you can't get without coming to Japan or conversing with actual like professors in that case. Um, I think you could say yes, but also like no, because it's still like it's still technically the same, but it's not quite like just the way that you organize your ideas and the way that you like just work with the language kind of evolves a lot, but it's still like the same. It still has like the same basic principles to it. And you can actually see it like if you go on Twitter, you can you can pick out the uneducated people from the educated people pretty easily just based on the way that they say it and the way they write something. Like their perspective in general, it's kind of weird, like so it, you, your abilities do evolve quite a bit, but I don't think it's like necessarily another level. It's like. It's just. More organized, and more clear. OK, cool, cool. So on the topic of learning in Japanese, do you think that there's actually disadvantages to this? Like, do you think studying law has hindered you in any way? Maybe, I don't know, getting a job abroad, for example, or using it in English? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I don't know. Like the way I feel about it is that I just kind of like specialized in knowing law in Japanese or Japanese law. So like when I look for a job now, like I kind of, I'm look, I look 
for more like things that I could use that in specifically instead of just like general nothing, just like, you know, random postings. So like when I was in Japan, I was looking at things like jobs at like um, the Canadian embassy or like the British embassy or whatever, you know, I didn't actually end up getting past the final screening thing on any of them, but I got to like the final interview on a lot of them. So like, that's like, like one thing I was thinking about. Then like, if you come back to Canada with it, there's stuff like in the, uh, I can't even remember what we call the department, but it's like, there's like a foreign affairs thing where you can go and they need like, uh, people to like analyze policy in Asian countries. There's those kinds of jobs. You know, I, I don't think it really held me back in any way. Um, it just made me more like specialized, I guess. Interesting. Cool. Hmm. Oh, Kanji, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, I am curious. So the desire to do all of that in Japanese, especially now that you're, you're back in Canada for a while, like, is that still, like, is it, why, why Japan for, for that, for, for studying? Um, it didn't really have to be, I don't think. I just kind of did it because I was there, first of all. And second of all, I didn't want to come back to Canada. And I only speak Japanese and English, right? So for me, like being in Japan was kind of like a survival thing and I kind of liked being there. So I decided to do it in Japanese. Um, that's pretty much it. Just kind of like a momentum thing. Like I was there, I was doing it. I spoke the language, kept doing it, kept speaking the language. And now you feel like you have enough momentum to eventually go back and, and just continue it because you already had that momentum. You can get back into school with your professor, like you said. So that's yeah. kind of where it's at. Um, so... Uh, here was a question for me uh, that I got on Discord. So this Kanji Eater, I know you're a busy guy, but I had some questions regarding professional programming and language learning, which are pretty specific to get answered by most learners. I'm going to Germany in a year and plan to study programming, and I feel like all the hard work in language learning that, that I've done will go to waste. So how was the process of language learning while still studying in your experience? Uh, though I might be mistaken by your fresh looks, you've actually looked in programming for a long time now. Thank you for the flattery. Um, I've worked in programming for seven years, uh, plus like four years of school. Um, so I definitely do have some, some experience at this point, like professionally. Um, but I would say like to the, the core question of how do you do language learning and studying school at the same time, like language learning was just like a hobby for me. It wasn't like survival, like Ham Slice was talking about. Um, my program certainly, my program was in America, so there was there was a small sect of um like a japanese department and that was about it um so i personally don't have a lot to say on how to get good with japanese while while doing education cuz i just went to some classes and that kind of kicked me off for some next steps in general i would say like if you are worried about you know, letting your time that you've spent with Japanese going to waste because you know that something more important is going to be coming up and taking your time away from it, which is what it sounds like, then uh, I didn't have this at the time, but my mental framework for this is, and I've talked about this before on the show, is like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? If it is lower on the pyramid, you don't really need to worry about... Um, Pri the prioritization is automatic. So if you know that you are going to school for programming and you know that's going to fund the rest of your life and give you a stable life, like if, if Japanese isn't at least that valuable to you, then it's, you, should, you shouldn't feel any sort of internal torture on that because it's the base thing. You need to be able to provide for yourself probably, it sounds like. So um, I, I'll talk about this a little bit more on some of the further questions but i mean i had to make some of these decisions myself recently and japanese for me is that like that top of the pyramid that self-actualization and then at the bottom where it's like safety needs physio physiological needs like being able to provide for yourself like that's what programming is for me so it, sometimes you just have to say yep that's that's the more important thing that being said um these guys have had some different experiences than me so Doth, maybe I'll kick it over to you first. Um, as far as language learning while studying, what's been your experience with that? Yeah, so for me at least, since at first I started studying Japanese because it was a thing to do, you know, for survival, kind of like ham slice. Uh, I thought that without Japanese, I couldn't do anything here for like uh, shopping, etc. But after a while, I realized that there's a lot of 
you know, stuff just in the Japanese media that I really love. May that be anime, manga, light novels, visual novels, of course. And so that kind of pushed me towards studying more and also thinking about the future uh, that eventually made me take the N1. So for me, while studying, I would say that it really does depend on your own uh, personal gain, the momentum you have, and also the, mo the motivation and I guess dedication you want to put in. Because for me, although I am studying engineering, which was well quite hard, at least for the first few years, I have gotten a lot used to it. But right, like recently, I have like the flow now, the workflow, the study flow. And so I can put more hours or at least like have dedicated hours to study Japanese. So like in the morning, do Anki reps, for example, at night, maybe like read a light novel or something. So, yeah. Are there, are there me, any points that you think I should probably be working on school stuff, but instead you're doing like, you know, trying to get better at Japanese or something? Like, have you dealt with that? Mm, uh, I've dealt with that during the summer holidays where I would like do the Tadoku tournament, like just read a ton, do a lot of uh, immersion. But at the same time, a lot of my senseis say that you should uh, fully enjoy your holiday. And for me, enjoying a holiday is like finishing a whole series of like uh, anime, or like finishing like a ton of visual novels, for example. So not bad, I, I would say, yeah. Okay, and then wh what about you, Ham Slice? How, how have you dealt with going to school and learning a language? I guess you didn't really have to choose between leaving the language behind or something since you were on board with it, but what was that experience like for you of balancing those two things? Right, so for me, I guess since I started out trying specifically to get into a Japanese university. My my biggest thing was just getting like the the courage to do something that I wasn't sure if I was actually going to be able to keep up with. So I had to kind of go like way out of my comfort zone to do that. And then once I started, it became more it became like a battle between, you know, time where I'm studying or working versus leisure time. And, you know, leisure time would be where you get most of your input usually. But one thing that I've been having problems with even like now is just balancing like leisure time where I actually enjoy the language versus time where I'm like grinding in the language. So like even like right now or even like not not today, but like even since I've come back to Canada, I read like I think like 100,000 characters a day for of, from like my law texts that I downloaded, for like the, the digital versions said to throw out my friggin physical ones. But because of that, I'm also translating and I don't have time to do like even simple things like read for the book club on DJT or whatever, or like, you know, any extra, you know, type of thing that I might want to do. And I think that that wears down on you a lot. So I think at the end of the day, you really want to have that like leisure time spent in Japanese. And I'm, I'm really having a lot of trouble with that, to be honest with you. Mm. <laughs> like I have no good answer. Interesting. <laughs> I, uh, I, we'll, we'll cover it a little bit later, but I also was dealing with that kind of recently. Um, okay, so next up, this is a question from Aiden. Uh, so it's in Japanese, so I'll read it and then uh, I'm sorry, son. Uh, so, take uh, it So, Bingo Shio Ninshu te Dorigurai Nandaska, Canada to Nihon Ryoho, Eto Okbe Mo Negashimas. Um, okay, so how much do lawyers make in Japan and Canada? And I actually that's right. Didn't really, I, I, didn't I wrote down up. the numbers though, and it was you wrote down the numbers in American dollars. Um, USA was at one hundred and twenty-two thousand, um, and you tell me if these numbers sound right to you. I'm sorry. Uh, Japan was about one hundred and seventeen thousand average, and Canada was about a hundred thousand average. This was with some preliminary Google searching. So, what are that you sounds way too much for J Japan. Really, Japan's probably like Japan's probably like half of that, I think. What? Because you have to, you have to like remember that there's a few like big guys who are making like massive, like six million a year or whatever. Yeah. I think the average, like if you're starting out, you, the average you're looking at is probably more like forty or fifty if you're lucky. I think. Even after like seven years of education. Whoa. Yeah, that's big bucks. That, that's what I was gonna say. So I mean, I work in tech, um, you know, software engineering. Uh, with a four-year degree, like you can usually get in at some place like baseline junior developer with like maybe like one internship or something or around like 80k USA dollars, and then it it is significantly less in Japan. And then, but but here's the thing: like 
in tech, like we've hired people like because because the tech industry is growing at such a ridiculous rate, um, people that just do like these boot camps and stuff and that you can actually get along with. Uh, we've brought in people that have had like a year of experience and they get like 70K like right off the bat. So it's <laughs> I guess your passion really has to be there to start off yeah. with that. Yeah. Well, I have the passion for it. And also once I get um, my credentials in Japan, I'm going to go back and I'm going to get like a, a master's in Canada. Then I'm going to take the test here and then I'm going to try and do like international stuff. Okay. So like I, I'm passionate, but I also have some like I have some goals that I'm going to use to take care of um, income. <laughs> and, and and then that also gives you a distinguishing factor because you're you're not the basic guy that's you know just starting off their career in Japan and law. You've got you know your your linguistic abilities, Cana- the Canadian stuff that you were just talking about. So that'll certainly put you at an advantage there. Okay. Um. Any, any, any other thoughts on uh, lawyer income there, Ham Slice? Ready for the next one? No. Okay. Uh, so the next one also from Aiden. Uh, so, Hogaku no benkyo te ego to nihongo dochi ga raku dasu ka? Hanrei chushin no hokube no hoga raku nan dasu ka? Honyaku shite kudasai. Um, he's asking if law studies are easier in English or in Japanese. I'm wondering if maybe common law is easier because it's, you know, based around um, decisions that courts have made. But honestly, I think that the, the civil law system is easier to study. So J- Japanese, I guess. Also, I'm more used to it in Japanese. So... Mm. so- do do you have any interest in in also expanding out to like America or anything like that, or is just Canada and Japan kind of the focus for you? Yeah, I would. It would have to depend. Like, I would probably like once I get if like once I finish everything and start working somewhere, it would probably depend on discussions with my boss because they would have to like sponsor you essentially. Mm. And Canada Canadian schools are cheaper. But guess what? No immigration because I'm a citizen. Mm. It's just really easy, right? You know. Okay. Cool. So uh, next section, uh, we're talking about time management. So this one's from Conjet. Uh, if you, uh, if I could spend fourteen hours a day for a long period of time, like two weeks, how should I spend those hours? Asking about what is most efficient. So maybe we'll start off with ham slice on this one, and if you have any input, we'll get to you too, Doth. Uh, so most efficient way to spend an intense amount of time, please. Um, I guess. I would wake up, like, I'm just assuming, like, the average, like, immersion learner here. Yeah. Um, Like, if it was me, maybe, like, two years in or something, I'd probably wake up, do my reps as soon as possible until I get tired. At least, if there's some left, I'll just time box it out later. Um, That'd probably be, like, an hour for me, because I was doing sentence cards, so it took a while. Um, Then I would probably read for, like, three or four hours at least, maybe five, maybe take a break go for like a jog for an hour while I'm listening to like podcasts or music or something. And that's already like what, seven hours ish. Then I'd probably come back and just like, if we're going input, I'd just like watch some shows, maybe YouTube or something like that in Japanese for a couple of hours. Um, and then if you get tired of that, you can always go on like, I don't know, some kind of language exchange and just find somebody to chat with or, you know, speak with just kind of balancing out everything, you know, reading, listening, speaking, writing, obviously with like less output if you're a newbie. So you favor more of the balanced approach there? Well, if I, if you have 14 hours, like, um, it's, I know from experience, it's hard to like sit there and read for like 12 hours. It's like, I used to, I used to switch between different like novels or like, I have like six things going at the same time, just swap between them because I had nothing better to do. Mm -hmm. But like, if you're going for like efficacy, I think a little bit of output in there kind of like, kind of like engages you more when you're reading because you, um, your brain tends to like, you know, really dig into things that it thinks it's going to use later. So if you're always in like a state of never outputting, it kind of it kind of is just a little bit less efficient, in my opinion. Like it's mostly the same, but I think you're just a little bit more engaged if you have a little bit of output every now and then, just a little bit. What about you, Doth? Fourteen hours. What are you gonna do with it? Yeah, 
I mean, I don't think I have much to add from like Ham Slice's uh, schedule, but I do want to add that, like Ham Slice has said, to always uh, be prepared with the material. So have six things that you're ready to read at mm. one time. Uh, and also, I do think that, at least for me, when I first started to read or like to immerse, I would try and find the best material to get the best games, you know, so check the kanji count, check how long it is, blah, blah, blah. But I think that these types of optimizations, the more time you use to do these, or well, the less time you actually spend immersing, like uh, you don't end up actually immersing. So I feel that in a sense, just get into it is also a good mindset to have. Get into it, take as long as you can. So that's that's probably going to be a good transition for my next question, uh, which was from Swaggy P. And he he asked me, I remember you mentioning that you had to start doing less Japanese due to some obligations. How did you adjust to spending less time? So in March, I made an episode about uh, it's time to get good with uh, Stevie and Jordan. And we kind of talked about how I was going to go like pretty hardcore, try to do like eight hours and, you know, typical like super grindy Japanese stuff. Um, and then, and that actually went really well and I really enjoyed it for a time. Um, and then it's not that I stopped enjoying that, but a new opportunity came up. And again, this is where I was mentioning like with Maslow's hierarchy of needs thing, it, it wasn't Japanese related even, and even though that's really where I wanted to be spending my time, it was, it was an opportunity for me to learn and spend a bunch of time with some friends learning how to do some difficult things that, um, I wasn't going to get another chance to do. So I had to make the decision, you know, do I do I push off, continue to uh, stay a little mediocre at Japanese, or do I take this other opportunity? And I, like it, it was kind of a no-brainer because I didn't have to make the decision. It's just like, oh, this is this is the best opportunity for me, career, financially, blah blah blah. Um, so took that and then spent a lot of time on nights and weekends uh, working with some friends on a project, and then. I eventually was like, okay, well, it's September. I really don't want to keep um, spending all of my time. And I will say, even though, even at that time, while I was doing, um, uh, essentially doing this this big project behind the scenes, um, I was still doing like four hours of like active immersion a day. And I don't think that includes Anki. No, it, it didn't include Anki. Um, so even on the back burner, I was still doing a lot. And that again is probably a reflection of just like, because my life is like pretty stable as far as like I was I was able to manage my time pretty well, um, but then uh, I was like, okay, well this this kind of sucks how how much time I'm spending working, uh, so I really don't want to do that. So I I put a stop there in September and was like, okay, I need a break. And then for some reason I said I'm just gonna work on an open source project because this this thing has been bugging me for a while, being able to manage like comics. Um, because I'm a pretty big comic hoarder. And so I ended up spending the next month actually probably spending more time working on things that were in Japanese. But it was something that I'd been like thinking about for like two years. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to knock it out. I'm going to time box it, spend about a month on it, and just hack some stuff out. And honestly, it was, it was kind of a nice way to switch up what I was doing because since 2019, when I've been just really consistently putting in the hours, this was the first time that I was like, I'm just going to code some stuff because I get into a flow state really easy. Like I said, I've been programming for like seven years, so it's really natural. I just think of ideas and translate it into code. And um, so it's kind of cool. And so it, I, th I think that was representative in how short of a time I spent writing that project and how many features like actually came out of it, like being able to split double images, being able to automatically upscale an image so that if it's like low resolution and you can't read it very well, that... Uh, you can use AI to enhance it, like those sorts of things. Um, so I thought that was that was a cool way to switch things up. But um, during that time, like especially considering I did it for a month, it was like I'm ready to be at the end of this so I can just get back to Japanese because it was kind of a distraction and a break. But um, for me, at least, it, it felt kind of good at that time. So since then, it was like, okay, adjusted to spending less time now it just kind of made me miss doing more Japanese even more. So the way I got back into it is, um, which I've been, you know, building up like my hours and my daily schedule again, getting all my old habits back in the flow of things. And um, it's since since I spent so much time working on like a comic tool, I was like, you know what, let's just uh, spend some time with manga. And so I was doing, 
I've probably been reading like one volume a day for, I don't know, probably like a month. And that, that feels good. And then plus like, that's not the only thing. So I'm also, you know, doing things outside of that. But for a while there, I just like was kind of pumping the brakes on reading manga and trying to read denser things. And um, I think that's probably why I ended up doing that project uh, subconsciously in September was just because it was like, hey, I kind of don't want to go back to reading some of these novels. And so I did take Ham Slice's advice. Uh, you say this a lot that uh, if you don't like it, just drop it. And I think that, you know, goes back to Katsumoto. And I, I think I was dealing with some of that. So and then I, also what Doth is saying, have at least a couple good ones lined up that are comprehensible because there for a while I think I was doing probably too much incomprehensible stuff and that was probably wearing on me. But anyways, that uh, I think that kind of ties back to um, uh, what we were just talking about there with, with Doth. Um, so the, the next question, um, well, I guess, I guess first off, have you guys, have you guys dealt with that yourself? Like having to adjust to less time in Japanese and how, uh, how, how did you deal with that? Are you guys just always, always around? So for me, at least when it comes to exams, like midterm exams, final exams, I do actually take the time to spend less time in Japanese. Uh, for me, it's kind of just a shift of uh, mentality from like uh, in the summer spending, I don't know, eight to 10 hours in Japanese having fun to like spending eight to 10 hours studying, I don't know, maths or physics. So yeah, the mentality is similar, but it's like a shift in like mm. where I put it into. So. What about you, Hamsless? Um, I guess the only time that I had trouble like fitting Japanese in was like my third year of learning after I started outputting and also when I started making my actual plans to go to Japan. So I had to save up money, finish high school and all that stuff. Um, I had to spend a lot of time working like at, at a construction site and you're not allowed to wear headphones in there for safety reasons. So one thing I did was I had like this. It was actually my sister's, but she let me have it, I guess. Um, I had like this little tiny iPod. I don't even know what it was, like an iPod mini or something like that, but it had like a built-in speaker. Hmm. I don't know if you guys ever had one of those. Like, it was what, like a, a small silver one. And I would wear a toque, and I would fold it in under in, into the toque, and I'd put it behind my ear so that I could hear Japanese 24-7. Basically, like I just kept the – I was like, okay, fuck this. We're going 24-7 regardless. Of any bullshit and the only time i took it out or not not just that but like my earphones and just like the general like having like a book a physical book with me in my bag everywhere the only time i took it out was doing like the final like exams for my high school credits because i wasn't allowed to have them but like aside from that i pretty much just just thought of like ways to keep myself in contact with it no matter what no matter what anybody thought of me and then i would have to go out of my way and make myself even like sometimes uncomfortable, like asking permission to do certain things. And that was pretty much it, you know, just because I guess the hierarchy of needs thing, right? That was my highest priority. So I prioritized that over everything else and anything that I couldn't make work, just kind of dropped that or avoided it and made sure that I could insert like Japanese into everything. Yeah, I, th I think you also touched on another good point that you, it, it sounds like you probably had uh, like I found with myself that because I already had the immersion environment set up, it was really easy to keep it going even when I got super busy. So did you find that as well? That just like because of your environment, how you set up, like you weren't going to watch English stuff during that time or something like that. Um, yeah, like, well, like I said, I'd cut my Internet cords. I couldn't download any English shows. I didn't have access to anything. I had no English DVD. Well, I had like, I had like a dual audio stuff like, you know, like house or whatever. Like I had the whole dub set of that, but I mean, like I just didn't watch it. Like it wasn't an option because I automatically would take the Japanese thing and I just wouldn't think about taking the English one. So I think, yeah, that helped a lot. Just having like, having that set up, having that habit set up and then just going and it just keeps going. It stays strong as long as you, you know, put in the, the, you know, minimal effort to maintain it over time. It, it, it helps a lot. Yeah. Uh, so this next question is um, one that I got after an interview. And uh, I guess I'll ask Doth this one. So um, 
person says, what would you say to someone who did some immersion for a year but made very little progress? I did it for a year but ended up stopping after a health scare made me reevaluate what I wanted to do with my life. So I quit making cards, but I still follow Japanese news accounts and all that. And this person maintains a Discord server, and they said, I, I still maintain it because uh, I want to keep up with up to date with the tools and developments. Uh, and I spent so much time on it in the past. And I want to correct people for making my mistake. But in truth, I didn't get very far. I think it has to do with depression and anxiety. Uh, any, any thoughts on that, Doth? Or, yeah. Okay. So, first one thing I think that if your case isn't the same as like ham size, where Japanese is your you're all in, you know, uh, that's your main priority. I don't think you should endanger your health. May that be physical or mental health, just for the sake of improving Japanese that slight bit. Uh, and also, in regards to the whole one year but made little progress, I do think that uh, one year and the actual amount of hours you put in can, you know, uh, show a very different picture. Because like you can say that uh, you've studied for like five years totally, but uh, you only study for, let's say, half an hour every week because that's the only amount of time you can put. Uh, that only adds up to, I don't know, maybe a thousand hours or so over those five years, which is very different to somebody who studies over the summer for like 10 hours a day and they can get maybe like, I don't know, 2,000 hours in like a year or something. So, yeah. But I do think that you shouldn't uh, feel that Japanese is impossible just because in one year you didn't seem to make much progress. Uh, I think you should kind of reevaluate uh, what you see uh, the value in Japanese, uh, what is it, what's its place in your like priority list and how you can go into getting back into immersion. So. Hamsize, any thoughts on that one? About, um, yeah. not really. I don't think I'm in a position where I can comment on like immersion versus, um, like psychological wellbeing because I just kind of ignored mine and just you know i guess i guess the ability to like ignore like an emotional problem is kind of indicative of me not being having any like underlying psychological issues um so i don't think it's would be fair for me to say anything just like i guess just like make sure that your needs are met like bottom line you know what i mean if you have to stop then you have to i guess yeah I'm actually in the same same position. Never had to deal with depression and anxiety, like Doth said. Like, if you need help, get it. Um, but yeah, I can't really comment very well there either. Um, so for Kanji Eater uh, by Pixel Parker, longtime Deep Weeb fan. Uh, by March or April, I'm going to Japan for work leisure, and I'm trying to understand how to put my time uh, to best use uh, so that I can get uh, so that I can hold at least a basic conversation. I've been immersing myself for six months, so my question is basically is, uh, do you think I should prioritize any form of immersion over the other to have the most gains? Uh, I would assume I should be listening more uh, since talking is my main goal, but then you got people like Doth that by reading a lot, uh, they were also able to get there. So I guess this kind of goes back to that 14 hour uh, thing a little bit. Like if you have the time and you know you have some goals, what are the best ways to get to that goal? If this person's goal is specific to being able to hold basic conversations, uh, what do you say, Ham Slice? What would be um, a good way? If the goal isn't anything except for conversations, I think you might do well with like YouTube videos with actual Japanese people where you can see their face. Because one thing that um, I think a lot of people overlook is the amount of information that you get from nonverbal sources when you're talking to somebody. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're, like, well, I think that a lot of people who would have, like, tried, like, um, conversation exchanges over, like, Skype where you can't see the other person's face, it's a lot easier to be misunderstood and it's a lot easier to misunderstand when you're at, like, a beginner intermediate level when you can't see the other person's face. So, you, I think that you should um, obviously get your, like, time in with, like, a lot of input, but make sure that you can kind of see the other person's face and at least some of it so you can kind of get a sense for, like, what... Japanese people look like when they think a certain thing or when they're going to because like for example if, if you're talking to a bunch of Americans you can tell when somebody's going to say something before they say it like you, it's hard to quantify but you can like okay this guy's going to talk so everybody stops talking they look at that person before they talk that's important like that flow of conversation and it'll make it easier and it'll make it easier for them to understand you if you can follow if you can sort of fall into that slightly 
even if you can't, even if you're not like really super good at expressing yourself, it'll be easier for them to pick up on a lot of stuff if you can like kind of imitate that a bit. So, so short term, pr- see their face. Prior- prioritize, yeah, something where you can see their face. Doth, uh, what about you? How would you prioritize getting to conversational fluency fastest? Honestly, I would say pretty much the same thing. Uh, look into YouTube more. Uh, possibly if there's hard subs, I think most videos do have them. Because at the end of the day, if you only want to converse, you actually don't have to know that much kanji. You can actually learn words just through romaji. I don't recommend it long term, to be honest. But if that is your only goal, then you might, you know, could be an option. Okay. And so for this next section, get into some more Japanese specific things. I think this first one's from you, Doth. You want to take it? Yeah. So. I have quite a few questions actually here. One thing that I'm very interested in, I think you did uh, touch this uh, on the last podcast, Ham Slice, but an ideal map to fluency. So from zero all the way to your current uh, level, Japanese ability, how many years or months, or if possible, like uh, concrete hours, do you think uh, you it would take you to get back to your level from zero if you were to use the most optimized uh, in your sense, you know, uh, in your opinion, the best roadmap? And like, what would it look like? If possible, maybe like per year, if that is possible. Yeah. Um, well, I think it would probably, I thought about this a bit and it's kind of hard to do like a per year thing after the first like two or three years because it's basically just re- repeating the same thing over and over again at that point. But I think I could probably get to like a similar point to what I am now at in like eight years, I think, instead of 12. If I started like, for like so like year one i guess i would just do like a core deck maybe the one that you can get from anacreon's website or whatever just like the really a really like a short brief one instead of doing rtk just to get you over the kanji wall and start inputting more and then obviously start mining i think i would still do um like some sentence cards i wouldn't make like a massive deck but i'd get like a couple hundred of them just to get like a little base of like i guess you know, like structurally what a sentence looks like and anchor it in my brain and then move on to like vocab cards for like the first year. Then I guess in like the second year, I'd probably do something like um, QM's Konkan deck because I think that that's pretty good. Um, it's better than RTK because it it's not going to like, you know, you're not going to get like lower retention rates the more you know because your association gets stronger with the actual words than your mnemonics. You're going to have like a good strong association of those kanji with like the nuances because of your input right so i'd probably do that and then just keep doing with like the reading maybe second year i'd start like having conversations with people instead of you know continuing with just input like mid second year instead of at the end of it and then i'd probably for forego doing like live broadcasts for actual conversations just because one way talking isn't the same as having a conversation like it doesn't actually improve well it does improve everything like slightly, but it's not, I don't think it's as good as talking to an actual person. So I'd swap that out. Third year, I would start like doing like hardcore output, like, you know, um, university prep type of stuff. And I'd probably have to focus a lot on the writing because that's something that I had trouble with, even though I did RTK, because even if you know, like the kanji, there's still like, there's still like a little tiny gap between knowing it and like imagining it and knowing like what word it fits into and actually automatically writing it out with your hand like like right now i can just start writing and i don't like there's no subconscious in between like there's no want to write word kanji write kanji there's want to write word word is written you know what i mean so to get to that like to jump that gap for every word i'd probably start that process just by like outputting writing and i I don't think you can overcome that with the conk deck either by the way just just by the very nature of it because it's it doesn't have like every word obviously so i would I'd start doing that then i'd you know obviously go into university and do that then start my law school thing i think that'd probably take like about eight years to get like roughly to like what i am now so i guess i wasted four years <laughs> yeah but very cool though i mean i think i will follow that you know because i'm in my third year now so I could definitely use that as a guideline, I think. So yeah, continue on. Actually, on that very topic, uh, the speed of learning Japanese, of course. Uh, I think a lot of people have put a lot of emphasis on it. Personally, for me, like I passed N1 in 1.5 years. 
But uh, if you look at the hours, I still think that it's comparable, like about 3K hours. So in regards to this, uh, what is your opinion on like the total amount of time spent in Japanese versus like the overall skill? Do you think that there's like an expectation everyone should have? And also, what is your opinion on very intensive study? So like 10, 12 hours a day uh, compared to like slow study, you know, like two or maybe three hours a day or maybe like even one hour a day, but very consistent type of study. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that um, in general, like total amount of hours, like inputting doesn't necessarily equal skill, like because we've seen like lots of people who just don't get very good for whatever reason. But I think that's because like immersion time versus actual skill level don't actually match up in like the, the actual like nature of what they are. Like immersion is your environment. Skill is what's is like the result of what actually managed to get into your brain. <laughs> So, so like it's it's kind of like the white noising argument like you can't you can you can turn on japanese for ten thousand hours and not un, and not even try to understand a single thing and get nothing or you could actually like focus be interested be engaged so but i mean it, the amount of hours that you're engaged completely with what you're reading or what you're listening to i think does like correspond with overall skill i don't think it's like perfectly equal or i don't think and I don't think everybody's going to have the same experience with like certain hour numbers, but definitely more time equals more skill if you're actually paying attention the whole time. And with regards to intensive study, so intensive study for you means like total hours in one day, like 10, 12 hours a day versus like one or two hours a day over a longer period of time. Yes. You mean? Okay. So um, I think this is, this is going back to like a really, really old age at post where he makes um a comparison between of between language learning and like boiling water right if you have water boiling and it's on low heat doesn't matter how long it's on that low heat it's not going to boil over ever whereas if you fucking crank it up it's going to start boiling you know what i mean and it's kind of like you see you start to see a pattern where it's like where it really is similar um where people who can spend like years just doing like one hour a day it just doesn't it doesn't reach like the, like a, a tip over point where it just starts to like you know come out naturally like it doesn't you ha you really have to kind of i don't think it's 12 hours a day by the way it's probably something more like six or seven <laughs> yeah real easy but um there's definitely like a, a minimal amount of time that you need to spend like per day before you before it really starts to like compound on itself properly like but then again uh like I don't know, like, I'm going to mention Quizmaster here again, because he, I don't think he spent that much time on it, but, like, I see his output every now and then, and it seems fine, like, he had, like, it seems pretty good, so I don't know. Like, I guess it depends on what you consider, like, good, quote-unquote, and also what you consider to be, like, I don't even know what I was going to say there, but the point is, I think, it, I think it's also, like, dependent on the person, too, so you kind of have to, like, observe yourself and think about your own progress and just kind of like adjust it as you go because some people are probably going to need way more time than others just and if you don't have okay, the option cool. of that um you know spending the six or seven hours your only option really is the consistency right and so like me working a full-time job is like uh, i i can sometimes get close but it's it's not as much time as i would want so it's like i eh, don't really have any other option unless i just completely shook up my life which i i don't really want to do that so it's different people's situations like <laughs> you just kind of have to deal with the cards you're dealt i guess or make drastic changes yeah true true so this kind of goes off the road but uh ham slice were there any times that you felt your japanese has increased exponentially like there's certain break points where you feel that uh suddenly yeah you become good at japanese dekiru or, or were there times where you felt that you were just stuck? You're plateauing and you couldn't, you know, get better? Mm -hmm. So I started, the first time that this happened was when, was like at the end of the second year of just inputting. Like I, I knew I was plateauing because I, I was running out of like words to mine, <laughs> stuff like that. And like my comprehension didn't seem to be getting any better. So I started talking with Japanese people and 
like as soon as I started talking talking to them, it was like amazing because like just the the feedback, like the uh, like the back and forth, like the amount of information I was getting for all the words that I was using and that I knew was just incredible. Like some things didn't didn't really get across. Other things went over like really well. I was like, wow, this is just crazy. And like that at that point, I felt like I was making like exponential gains through the output. Um, another time I thought I was plateauing was like, I guess my third year of university. Cause I was just, by that point I was used to it. I was just doing like day in and day out, studying, going to classes, taking notes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't feel like I was improving. Um, but I, when I started to study for law school, um, I think I, I got started getting a lot better again. Um, just because of the way that you have to like just the the amount of, that you have to write for the exams for example like some places there's like seven hours worth of written tests in one day <laughs> for like one school which is kind of ridiculous but like that practice like that just volume i think really picked it up and got me over that plateau and i guess the next plateau is like right now you know i'm just i feel like i'm coasting right now kind of Epic. Would you say you're satisfied with your current level, or do you think there's another peak that you can kind of chase after? Um, that's kind of a weird question for me because I I don't feel like you can ever, ever really have like perfect Japanese, quote unquote. Like even if you do reach like a native level like of output, it still probably wouldn't be the same output you would do as if you were actually born a native. Like with your same voice with your same like input it'd probably be different just because of the way it interacts with your like character that you already have you know like it'd still be different so i think there's always gonna be something that i'm gonna be like working on or like you know thinking about just because at this point now i'm just i just enjoy the process of like learning new words and like thinking about it etc cetera, etc cetera. so i guess like right now i'm just you know slowly Coasting. working on improving myself slowly but okay. I, like, it feels like I'm coasting though, definitely. Nice, nice, good to know. So on the topic of natives, you know, getting closer to natives, getting into the culture, mm -hmm. uh, you are married or were married, I would say. Uh, do you think that out of, you know, besides the kind of nasty experiences you've had with, uh, you know, your wife, ex-wife, and maybe the family, has it ever helped your output, your understanding of Japanese? Especially since you as a father have to manage the household and kind of everything with that. So um I I guess it kind of did because it's like I, I think I mentioned in the last podcast, like the the type of information that you're that the person you're talking to gets from the words that you're speaking and you intend don't necessarily line up. So there's a lot of like cultural stuff that I kind of am that I kind of didn't understand before, but I have a better understanding of now, especially since that her whole family, my wife's whole family was like super old school. Like her dad grew up basically in like the mountains with no wa with no water piping, no electricity or anything like that. Like it, the guy was just insanely different from me. So the, the amount of stuff that I learned from him about Japan is pretty significant. Um, and I think that that helped communicating with just Japanese people in general, in a way that like, even after all that input, like you think like after you're fluent, you're like, okay, well now I'm epic and all this shit. But you just start to like, see like the, the, what should I even say? Like just the, uh, just the, like the, the more subtle nuances of what they're saying, like what they're actually thinking, instead of just like reacting to what they're saying. Right, like so, the like, atmosphere yeah. in a sense. Kind of yeah, like you say something, they don't say anything, but you know how they, how they took it, like almost instantly. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but it's it's really like, I, I don't want to say that Japanese people are like psychic or anything like that, but there's a definite like shared experience that results in like the ability to kind of, not completely, but partially like understand people intuitively. Is that part and of I think the that, that that whole culture like ukiyo-yomu sort of thing, right? Like. Or is that, would you say this is something different than that? I, I guess they're, yeah, it's definitely like related. Um, it's not like meme status or anything like that. It's just like more of like a, like a, a person, it, like it's different from each person, like the way that people react and think obviously, but just kind of like, uh, 
I can't really even explain it, but just it's definitely related to that. Yeah. Okay. So something you, you got to learn yourself, you got to well, experience yourself then. Yeah. So, yeah. So actually on the topic, because you have a lot of experience uh, getting married, dating, of course, what are your views on dating and marrying Japanese girls or men also? Do you have any tips, maybe do's and don'ts for, you know, all the people watching? Mm -hmm. I don't have any do's and don'ts really. Um, I'm kind of assuming that most people are, who are listening to this are going to be like, you know, immersion learning type people. So there's going to be like, obviously, like the linguistic thing is going to be there with like lots of time and stuff put in. But like, again, just the cultural differences, you have, something you have to be careful of, because um, sometimes um, I think that if you're dating a Japanese person, there's going to be a lot of things that they don't understand are not going to be shared with you. Like just cultural things, values, things like that. And they'll assume that they can talk with you and like kind of, you know, it'll be like give and take. But just because you weren't like raised in Japan by Japanese parents, there's some things that you're not going to understand like off the bat or not going to do off the bat or not going to understand, et cetera. And I think a lot of times there's people that who, who will feel that their needs are not reciprocated. And Ooh, okay. they, you might get like, you might end up being um, resented by your partner if you're not really careful. So, and I think that uh -huh. that happens a lot. And, and I think that one of the, uh, like the end result is a lot of people just being like, like a lot of Westerners just like, um, just kind of like, I don't know, criticizing their character, their partner's character when in reality, it's more of like a cultural shared thing that just got stomped on really hard by them. and They didn't even notice. <laughs> Right, right. In that case, where would you draw the line between you acculturating to the Japanese, and actually you uh, asking the Japanese or like your partner to uh, understand your own values as maybe a Westerner or, or, or a gaijin? It really depends on what your partner's like, I think. I think that some people are definitely not ready, like some Japanese people are not ready to do that necessarily. Like, you know, if you're, if you grew up in like a Western country, a lot of times you assume that if you express yourself or if you, if you're, un, if the person you're talking to like understands you more, you're going to have a better, un, a better like relationship or like have more respect for each other. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, in Japanese culture, if like sometimes you're going to run into problems in cases where you're just like, the more you express yourself, the more like the less respect somebody is going to have for you or the more of yourself you put out there, the less people like you because of that very fact. And it's just like, it's going to be hard for some people, I think, who are just not ready for that. So I guess my advice would be to, I don't know, date like the kooky girl, quote unquote. I don't know. So yeah, that is the advice. So uh, I guess the next one is for all of us, uh, which was from Nakamura-san. Uh, it seems like uh, they are a Akunohana fan. Uh, how many kanji do you know? This is, this is always a favorite one. How many kanji have you eaten today, kanji eater? Uh, so I, I mean, this is, this is kind of hard to actually know for sure. Uh, I dumped some stats from Anki as far as how many unique kanji are in there and that's that's kind of the best way i have to ballpark it i guess which it says that i've got 2756 unique kanji that i've run into and that and those are like active cards that i that i work on and then uh of that like the joyo kanji like 99 percent of those are covered um through grades one through six but then like junior high school drops off a bit at like 92 percent of those um, that being said, like my mature rate in Anki is pretty trash right now. I uh, have hovering like around 70, so I'm working on getting that up. And then like my young cards, I've managed to fix the retention for that so that those are staying pretty, pretty consistently at like 85-ish, which means that I'll eventually trans transition over into uh, mature cards. So if you take 2,700 and, you know, you multiply it by about an 80% chance of getting it right or something like that, it's probably somewhere around there of how many I could just like immediately know in, in some context of a word. Um, but what about uh, you, Doth? Where, where are you at with how many kanji do you okay. know? 
So at least for Anki, I kind of st- stopped mining because I got like a good number for now. It's uh, three six 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 is the number in Anki at least. But here's the thing, right? The number of kanji I I can say I can confidently read at least like unyomi kunyomi maybe three thousand, hmm. uh, maybe a bit lit- little than that actually. The ones I can confidently write is like the uh, kanji kente nikyu, so like. I know Joyo 2000 ish. But here's the thing if you were to ask me, you know, tell me to write an essay or like do, uh, I don't know, my homework in Japanese, write it down like Ham Slice would do, I probably couldn't or it would take me a long time. So I think there's a lot of nuance to like actually knowing kanji. I would say the same. I definitely couldn't. Ham Slice, what about you? Um, I, th- I think I definitely feel what Doth is saying about like the, um, the difference between being able to write a kanji and doing like your homework or doing like an exam in kanji because like that ha- that split second that you need to remember the kanji and write it if you do that a thousand times that's a lot of time in one exam like you you're going to finish you're not going to finish writing the entire thing so i definitely feel that um with the number i know i don't actually know like i don't have anki stats well i i have like my like my law deck that i'm doing right now but i don't have the uh the kanji the kanji heat map thing so i don't know um if i had like i did so i did rtk i did both of them and i know that i can write all of them still and i can write if like if i have a word that i have to write with those kanji in it i know that i can produce it pretty much automatically in most cases so i'd say like i don't know and it's like pretty easy too so i don't know i think i can confidently like just like write and use like maybe 3,000 to 3,500 ish. I don't know how many I can read, but quite a bit. Like there's um there's some like website that I posted on Twitter once where you can like just like say if if you know kanji or not know it, and it like estimates how many you know. I, it usually gives me like 5,000 ish, just for like quote unquote no, but that's including like Q, I don't know kujitai and stuff like that, like the old kanji. So I I don't really know, but it's it's like in that range, like. Passive versus active is like 3,500 versus like 5,000-ish. So not like I couldn't pass Kankem 1. It would probably take quite a lot of effort to do that. Hmm. Um, okay, so next question from Ayachi. Uh, are there any things in particular that you think are overestimated or underestimated in learning Japanese? Uh, I would say for this one, uh, the length of the, of the journey is probably... What sticks out to me as something that I, I underestimated uh, when I started, was, which was like, like traditional classes back in like 2014 before I even knew anything about immersion-based learning. I was like, oh, I'll probably, probably will take me a little bit longer than Spanish or something like that if I put in like, yeah, you know, a, a little bit of work. And then I was just like, oh, this is, you know, even, even from here, it's like another year and a half of of study even with my current ability it's like i'm still probably not going to be where i want to be which is at some point being able to just like listen to audiobooks and be able to understand it really well or something like that like there's still a long road ahead and so i would say that was something that i i probably underestimated you know and i don't know that maybe when i started i had i i even comprehended that it's it's really like a lifelong endeavor um but what about um what about you doth Anything over underestimated yeah. or underestimated? I think our whole conversation about kanji is one thing a lot of people overestimate. Mm. Like knowing kanji, how much kanji you can actually read, for example. Because I used to think that, oh, I can read like 3,000 kanji because I can do the quiz pretty easily. But then like if it comes to hard novels, I would still need time to pass them, you know, look up stuff. Mm. And for underestimating, I think, like you said, the journey. But not the length, but like the friends you make along the journey. Mm. Not mean, but an actual thing. Because I do think that a lot of the communities we have, uh, they've boosted me to actually be more motivated to, or at least like feel responsible to immerse to like a certain extent. And also, I guess just learning Japanese, getting to know people, even if it's like at first just to like improve my Japanese. Later on, we become close friends. We actually do stuff together, travel. And so, yeah, the friends. But you, ham slice. Um, okay. I think that at the start, people overestimate how hard it is to get to like a good, decent level of Japanese. Like they, like, so like, um, you might go 
onto like DJT, for example, or on the, uh, the, the server and see like, you know, blues or oranges typing in Japanese. And you, if you're starting out, you might be like, wow, that's amazing. It's going to take forever. It really doesn't to just like get to that point. But on the other hand, I think that people who are at that level and who are seeing like, you know, decent progress, like I guess you call them even newbie gains where you're just like making progress. And like, wow, this is going to be fucking easy. Let's go, let's go, let's go. So those people underestimate how hard it is to move past that. Like once you get to the intermediate area, there's like a there's like a massive span of time where you just feel like you make no progress whatsoever. And honestly, once you get past that and you get to a spot where you all of a sudden feel like really confident in everything, once you start getting past that, you start to realize that that confidence was built on like misunderstandings, you making assumptions about, you know, meanings and, you know, cultural implications and et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, like it just falls apart again. <laughs> I'm not making myself sound like I can't do anything, but obviously I, I can do some stuff, obviously. But like, so I think that like, if you're going to like talk to like um, people online who have been studying for like, you know, a couple of years, just take their advice with like a grain of salt. Like most, like if they're giving you advice on how to study, I'm sure it's like perfectly fine. But like, just sometimes it's really hard to see what you can't see because you're your own culture, your own experience, colors, everything, colors your input to a certain extent. So you end up making a lot of assumptions and you just don't see it until you see it, you know? I look forward to the day where I once again realize how bad I am only to uh, <laughs> realize how good, how good I am I mean, and then how bad I am That's me every again. other day, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think the next one's uh, a doth question. Yeah, actually, I did have some questions uh, about like extreme cases of studying Japanese, but I think you kind of answered this with the previous talks about time. There's other another question, like since you've lived in Japan, especially like Tokyo for a really long time, do you think that it's rare to find foreigners who are really good in Japanese or like similar ability to you? And were they also immersion based or like how did they become really good? Um... The only time I've met people who I thought were at my level at that time, twice. Two people. And after that, it, yeah. And after that, I met people who I, I could tell were immersion based learners, but weren't quite where I was. Because obviously, as time passes, I, like if I meet somebody at the 10 year mark and they're at like the three year mark, I don't think that they're quote unquote at my level. So I don't think that's, it's kind of like hard to like give an assessment of that because just the time that I meet them obviously puts them at a disadvantage there but I saw I met one guy who was like a, a black French guy at like a foreign exchange or not a foreign exchange like a like an exchange party thing where you're supposed to meet foreigners and blah 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 I didn't like him he was like super pushy and really like and really just mean like you could like okay this is completely unrelated to language learning but like you know like racism and shit like that if if somebody has some shit said to them Earlier that day, most of the time they can't react to it just because you don't react to it like automatically. You know what I mean? Like kind of sits in your head and kind of just like, you know, pisses you off as the day goes. That guy had some shit happen to him that day. Then he meets me, white guy, good at Japanese, threatening, asshole. So we kind of like, and he's like, oh, and he was like talking to all the girls, trying to like get them away from the Japanese guys and me. And I was like, bruh. Whoa, and stuff you know what i mean like i was like okay i'm just gonna leave <laughs> but like i totally i kind of understood where he was at like mentally because i i don't know i just i've had shit happen to me too but anyways that's neither here nor there then there was another guy who came to my izakaya when i was working and his girlfriend was very obviously an immersion learner of english so it was very interesting and, but that guy worked at, he was making obviously good money because he was wearing good clothes and everything. And he told the boss that I could probably make like five times more money doing anything else. And then my boss was like, Whoa. okay, I'm not going to tell Hamslice that. <laughs> and he just pretended that conversation never happened, even though like I actually heard it because he didn't want to lose me, I guess, because the other people that were working there was like two Japanese people. But then there was like a Vietnamese guy who couldn't understand Japanese at all. And like, uh, God, I could talk about these people for hours because they were amazing. But then there's like a Nepalese guy who is like, who had been living in Japan for 10 years and who was just like absolutely batshit insane. But Damn. 
that's neither here nor there. So those are the two people. Then after that, I met like immersion learners, like people coming to coming through exchange programs to my university. And they'd be all like, oh, like I'm epic, you know, Katsumoto successor. And they'd be like, you know, flexing a Japanese. I'd just be like sitting there. I'm just like reading a book. And but it's it's weird because they because you guys, you immersion learners like to flex on people, man. It's weird. Like you got to stop doing that because you don't right. know who you're talking to all the time. And then I would just come <laughs> back and I'm like, no, I I'm an actual student here. How you doing? <laughs> and one guy wow. got super salty and I was like, just don't fucking come near me then, bro. Go and sit in your little gaijin corner with the rest of your like with the rest of your exchange class and I'm going to go take my real actual courses. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah there's like you know there's some comp like competitiveness and assholishness but like uh, in general like you can you can spot immersion learners pretty quickly just because like input based learning is just so much better like you can instantly spot them so mm. it's pretty interesting cool wow so only two people in 10 years an all a really sad moment though you know got to comment on that definitely yeah actually on the topic of you taking classes uh, what were the impressions of teachers, you know, on the subjects you took about your Japanese or maybe like you as a gaijin in general? Did this in any way benefit you or maybe hinder you knowing that, about that? You know, you're a gaijin or like you're Japanese and stuff. Okay, first, I don't know about other schools, but my school did not give you extra points for or they didn't give you like the benefit of the doubt for not being Japanese. And I didn't like I didn't really necessarily assume that I was going to get one or any benefit of the doubt or like you know extra points or whatever. But I went to, I was going to like office hours and stuff like that to talk to my professors. And that's when I heard it. And, and like, I basically learned that one, they don't, they won't help you with GPA stuff because GPA is not as important in Japan. So like, if you're like, oh, I missed this work, do you think you can help me out so I can keep my GPA? They'll be like, no, <laughs> first of all, second of all, I figured out that if I make a mistake, that's on me. They don't care. Well, some might care, but like, I, as far as I could tell, like I wasn't given any kind of like help, especially because I was foreign, which kind of it, it actually kind of sucked because I don't know, man, it's hard to it's hard to survive sometimes. Like if you're if you've been working like all, all hours you can work. So 28 hours as a student, then you've done all your courses and it's Friday and you're like exhausted and you still have to you know study through the weekend and your professor's like, it's kind of on you, bro. You know, what do you want me to do? Damn. It's not written correctly. What, like, what? <laughs> but then on the other hand, they won't correct you either. So like, they'll just accept whatever's wrong. You know what I mean? So like, I've seen like, I, I made, I made some friends who are Chinese and who are doing like, um, master's study or master, they're, they're studying for their masters. And I really like their thesis and I'd be like, Hey, wait, this Japanese is pretty wrong. And you're just going to hand it in. Like, yeah, my, my academic advisor is like, yeah, that's okay. And I'm like, oh, okay. So like your professors won't correct your Japanese for you they'll just kind of like sometimes it, it won't affect your grade sometimes it will but I've found that they just kind of you know Don't let care. you sink or swim and I actually had one Chinese friend who it was a girl who got in somehow at like and she only had N2 and it was really weird because she was Chinese but but her her Japanese was completely flat, like unaccented at all. And it was so weird. And I was like, what is going on with this girl? And, but her GPA was like one point one point like zero six, something like that. And I'm yeah. like, damn, like the professors don't give a shit about you being foreign. Like they will, they will kill you. So I, I studied harder after that for sure. Um, and as for underestimated, um, I think I mentioned my civil law 101 class, you know, first day, Monday, you know, the first period of the day was civil law. 2,000 kids in the class, me sitting right up front because I didn't want to sit because, I, like, just the Japanese kids were, like, some were already sleeping, some had their phones out, huh. some were, like, chatting with everybody. I was like, okay, this is, this is just annoying as hell. But I also noticed that the farther away from the front that they are, the more dense they the mm, class yeah, the students yeah. were. so like there's like at the front of the class there's nobody there basically except like three people so i'd always sit at the front just so i didn't get distracted so there's me front center fucking white guy just like kind of sitting like this <laughs> and i'm like i'm like i'm like 25 so i'm seven years older than everybody 70 year old professor just kind of like hobbles up to the to the thing and he looks at me and he's like are you in the right classroom and i'm like <laughs> i just did not 
And the bell rang wow. right after that, so I didn't say anything, and I just looked at him, and then he started. And that continued for, like, a couple <laughs> weeks, where he would just ask me. But he always comes, he would always come in, like, right before the, the bell, because there was, a, like, a, there was a bell at, at my school. Mm. So, like, I didn't actually get to talk to him until, like, third or fourth week. And at that point, like, when that happened, you know, obviously he understood that I could, that I was, a, like, a, that I could speak just fine, and we got along fine after that. But, oh, okay, I don't even know, this is... This is going off the map. Sorry if I waste any time. But same professor. He was close with students that were in his like, you know, personal seminar thing, because that's one of the things they do here. They'll have like little clusters of students with one like professor. So one of his students apparently was in like an English learning circle. And there's a there was a foreign guy with glasses and it was blonde who had like four girlfriends in that circle. And he would just dump them randomly. Like he would just, you know, like have sex with them and dump them. So this professor comes up to me in front of class and he's like, is it you? And I'm like, why would I be in an English speaking circle? It doesn't make any sense. And, but that followed me for a while because like, I was the only, I was the only blonde guy. I was the only white guy. First of all, I was the only blonde guy with glasses in pretty much the whole school. Right. Except for exchange students. And that guy left at the end of the year. So I, I was like the Chad quote unquote, without being the Chad with where I was actually like studying every day. So it was like, it was weird, fucking annoying. But yeah, that happened. The Chad reputation has just encircled you (laughs) the whole time, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) Damn, ton of golden moments though. We were, you know, uni. Love to, you know, hear more if you do have them. So yeah, maybe some other time. (laughs) Sure. I guess one final question, like on this topic, at least, uh, how do you stop? Because like at first you were underestimated by the professor, right? But like after the third or fourth class, you can just talk to him normally. How would you say is a good way to stop people from underestimating your Japanese? You know, the Nihongo Jose and like get them to actually be serious. Okay. So I have, I have a couple things to say about that, actually. One of them is that you can never, you'll never like 100% get rid of people assuming you can't speak English when you first talk to them. Because I, one thing I noticed is that some people, some Japanese people, when they notice that you're foreign, they won't even necessarily look closely at you. They'll just see that you're foreign and like they formulate like what they're going to do in their head before you're before you be in front of them, before you have to talk to them. So they'll have like a, a, an English phrase pre created in their head to say wow. to you, or they'll have like, yeah. this isn't all of them. This is like, I don't know, maybe like a quarter of people that, that you meet maybe like on the street or whatever, like, so they'll just have the assumption foreign equals can't, therefore I do this, then they'll do their automatic thing, right? This is why you get people like, like people who are like half Japanese and raised in Japan, they'll still get that sometimes it's because people see them, they'll just formulate the thing and they'll spit it out. But if it's not that, like if that doesn't happen, then you can um, make people like instantly like interact with you normally. And so when I read your question the first time, I was at the airport ready to leave. So I was just mm-hmm. like, I just decided to like observe how I was interacting with people, like at the airport, like with the, uh, like with the airport girls. And there was one girl who came up to me and she started talking in English and I didn't say anything. I just said, oh, or something like that. Like I just made like half a yeah. sound and she's like, oh, and I was like, okay, something's up there. <laughs> like. So I think it's kind of like it's kind of like a body language thing partially. And it's also like just like a reactionary, like I said, with like the conversations and like reading people, you can like activate the Japanese portion of their brain and just put them on autopilot. So like one example that I have of putting somebody on autopilot was like my senpai from uh, university. He was like, you know, big shot, whatever, you know, got into famous company, blah, 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 boring as hell, whatever. And he'd like to give advice to people. And so one day he's like, Hamasa. I guess I should probably use this in English, but he, he's like, you should go and you should study abroad because if you don't, people are going to assume that you just lack like experience. And I'm like, who are you talking to? <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he just blanked out for like 20 seconds. He's like, what is this guy saying to me? And, and then he's like, oh. <laughs> so like, it's kind of like, you know, like if you're talking to like your grandma every day, you're like living with her and you're like, hey, grandma, can you pick that up? 
And then she's like, I can't because I'm old and my back hurts. And you just completely free it because you're interacting oh, yeah. like directly with her character. Like you're interfacing directly with like her mind, I guess, instead of like taking her for what she looks like. You kind of like forget about whatever limitations she might have. So you just kind of like, you just kind of have like a grandma in your head and you're like interacting and you just act normal how you would with your other friends. Same thing with like being foreign in Japanese. You know what I mean? Like you can, once you get past a certain point, you can activate that with body language or you could activate it with like your, in, with your relationship with that person. But doing it like when you first meet somebody, there's always going to be that like small portion of people who formulate something before they even talk to you. So there's not really a chance of having like 100% always treated as Japanese, but you can get pretty close. Like you can activate that just by the way you act. Yeah, I feel like it's a first impression kind of thing. Like, I don't know, after after you actually start building up a relationship with somebody, it's not like they're all the time saying, oh, Nihongo Jozu, Nihongo Jozu. Like, I mean, it's it's like kind of a nice filler thing at the beginning with relationships that kind of just paves the path when they don't really know you. Right. Another thing with not really knowing you is sometimes they'll use it as like a conversation starter. Right. Like, and then you just kind of talk and then, you know, but lots of people will take that at face value and be like, why are we always talking about Japanese? It's like, bro, that's how you start conversations. Yeah. Okay? You start with what you know. Cool. Really good advice. Yeah. Love to hear. All right. So next one, uh, this is for me from Pazadora. Uh, are you still enjoying the Japanese journey or is making tools part of your motivation? I hate making tools like the things that I have released and like made I have made because nobody else has done it and it's like I have this ability to write code ability it's a skill that I worked many years to get good at built a career around and at some point I said okay well this thing in my life is inefficient like for instance mining mining words off Kindle I decided I wanted to make an automated way because I saw nobody else was doing it the way that I wanted so I could um, kind of goes back to kind of what Doth had said before, where, um, you know, you can take all this time to build out some super efficient thing, and probably the more efficient use of your time would be just doing the thing instead of doing something like building a tool that automates it all. And yet, I I have I have uh, dabbled in building tools and that sort of thing quite a bit. Um, that being said, that's always in my mind. It's like I'd rather just be doing stuff in Japanese. So no, not super motivated to make tools that's why um usually what they are, are things that i built for myself and i hope other people can use them um so i guess the first part of that question though was are you still enjoying the japanese journey yes every day that's why i have a schedule so that i can get the most out of every day with japanese um i i don't see myself stopping anytime soon so you guys are gonna have to get used to me for a while because I'm, I'm still gonna keep going um yep kind of where that's at yeah I mean, you got to say that those tools are really useful, though. I do use the Kindle one, and it is oh. nice to have, definitely. Awesome. Glad you use it, Doth. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. So next section is Japanese and culture. So um, this first one is for Ham Slice so from Ayachi. Uh, how is life like in Japan? Any advice you can give to people who plan on moving there? Mm -hmm. Um... Uh, for me personally, I liked it because I'm the type I'm the type of person who likes to spend my free time alone, and I like to just kind of you know do my own thing. But I think that a lot of foreigners have trouble like kind of quote unquote breaking into like friend circles or whatever. But I think that the the red pill there is that Japanese people don't really have that robust of social circles either. So like you kind of have to be ready for that. Um, aside from that, just like general advice, I don't really have any because. Like the stuff that screws that screws you up is just like the stuff that's specific to your life or your circumstances or the people that you end up meeting. Um, yeah, the only real advice would be to try and like, I, I don't think that you should like get, make like a, a gaijin bubble around yourself, but like know people who have moved to Japan, like, or like, you know, like, um, I don't know if you guys know Nyangachi, but he has like a server specifically made for people moving to Japan. It's actually, it's, it's good. It's got like, you know, information on housing and stuff like this. It's really, it's really organized and really nice. You should, if you find him, you should t ask him about it. If you're interested in moving to Japan, um, Quaid's in there too. If you, if you know him, um, 
so I think that you should just like try and find places where there is information that you know is accurate and try and run off that and then kind of combine that with your circumstances, you know? So you kind of have to be ready for like a battle because anybody who's never immigrated before is probably not ready for that. Like from the beginning, like regardless of what, what they hear or read or think they're ready for, because it's just a, a pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, so just be ready for, just be ready to work hard, I guess. And gather information as best you can yeah when when i did my six month stay over there like since it was with a company like they they took care of like all that for me and it was still like a nine month process of them just getting like legal paperwork and there were like full-time people working on it so i can only imagine if i had tried to do it myself like like you said a lot of work <laughs> long process or at least it can be um let's see next one's a doth question yeah. Yeah, so another question about, well, this is about Japanese society, though, because you did mention that a lot of Japanese people have this kind of automatic uh, thing in their brain where they do a thing, uh, they say something in English towards uh, foreigners. But do you think, like, the general usage of English is lacking in Japan? And do you think that uh, studying Japanese would be increasingly useful, you know, towards the future? Um, okay, I don't think that Japanese people should use more English necessarily. I think it's fine, you know, like, you know, it's their language, what the hell? They can do whatever they want, right? In fact, it probably should be mostly Japanese because, you know, trying to force young kids to like, you know, understand a new culture that they don't really ha have any experience with or care about is kind of like, it's pointless. So I don't see why that they should, like, I'm sure it's fine right now. Like they can do even less English in my opinion, you know? Like maybe start serious English studies from like university even because I started when I was 20. Like why, you know what I mean? Like class classroom studies aren't going to make kids under 10 better regardless of any kind of like age benefit, you know? Like the classwork's just not going to do it. So you can't standardize it either. So I would say just stop wasting, wasting your budget. Um, as, in, as for... Um, studying Japanese being useful, I'm not sure if it will be because um, just like the shrinking population <laughs> and like the increase in like English language, like solutions to problems, like automation, stuff like that, it's probably going to get more convenient for both people who can't speak English in Japan and people who can't speak Japanese outside of Japan, like it's going to get easier and easier. So I'm not sure that it's necessarily important, quote unquote, like it'll be just as fun, obviously, but I'm not, I, I just don't know how, like, like it's kind of hard to like predict what the market for Japanese skills is going to look like in the future, but I don't imagine it like growing massively or anything like that. It's probably at best, it'll probably just like stay roughly the same at worst. It might go away. I don't know. Like I'm not an, an economist or anything like that. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I would say in tech I see this too because like the it's the Japanese resources for programming are significantly limited compared to the English counterparts and when you think about what is spawning like rapid economic growth a lot of it's going to be technology based, right? So Japan really would have to level up their contributions to technology as a whole and I mean they're it's surprising how big of an influence they already have. But when you compare that to China or America, which just is like, you know, booming, it, it's, it's a rough uphill battle, I think. So let's see. Next question is from uh, Yasuoka. Uh, so, and this is a Japanese native that I think you guys know, right? So anything you hate in Japanese culture? Ham slice. Not really. Um, yeah, not really. Good news, Yasuoka. You're fine. You're fine. It doesn't mean I like Yasuoka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's okay. a hard question, though. Yeah, what about you, Dato? Yeah, because, like, at one side, I want to hate something about Japan. Like, let's say like they're being too conservative, for example, or like it's hard to converse with natives, for example. But that's also a me thing at the end of the day. Mm. And since like, if you want to get close to Japanese people, you got to know Japanese. Uh, I mean, yeah, that becomes a really 
convoluted uh i don't know i guess explanation and question so i don't think i have something per se i really hate maybe the lack of food i like is something i hate i don't think it's a culture thing though but japanese people they don't like spicy food i really like spicy food wasabi is the only yep. thing that's spicy here and that's not even spicy that's just like your nose hurts so so yeah if it's if it's something it's the food i would say honestly I found that too. Yeah, as as somebody whose favorite food is jalapenos, like it's you can't get jalapenos in Japan. So I was, I was rough. What uh, what what foods do you tend to eat over there, Doc? Uh, hmm. Any anything really that is spicy. <laughs> that that's like the main game. So, uh, like in, in oh, you mean in Japan, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or Indonesia. Uh, uh, in in okay. Japan specifically. I mean, in Japan, either way, I like Indonesian food the best. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of an insult, to be honest. But yeah, I mean, home is the best. But there are yeah. some f- food I kind of like, I guess. Sushi is nice. Okonomiyaki. I mean, the food you find in stores, I like them, like takoyaki and stuff. So, yeah. I would say, like, it, home is best. So, like, but but you can't get American food in Japan. Like, it's like their cheeseburger is like <laughs> meatloaf. So it's like, I hate meatloaf. I love cheeseburgers. Yeah. I like miso soup actually a lot. Okay. So they got if I can get a wife to make me miso soup every day, mm. that would be nice. All right. So next question uh, is also for Ham Slice uh, from a random user. Uh, what is your favorite piece of Japanese culture uh, that you could fully enjoy thanks to your Japanese level? Um, I guess it would be uh, novels, mm. I think. Like I... I think I mentioned before that I'd start, I started with novels at the same time as I did with everything else. So uh, one thing I would do is I would read like Kokoro every year, just to, like see how much more information I got from it. And like the difference in information that I get now from even like my third year in when I thought I was like this epic Japanese learner is pretty significant just because of like the cultural meaning of certain, like even just like objects or like actions or like statements is significant. And I think that that just really helped me like we read um confessions of a mask in uh, by yukio mishima in our djt book book club thing and like the first time i read that i you know it was pretty interesting i didn't get that much information from it just like basic like thematic things but this time when i was reading it i I made notes and i ended up making like twelve thousand characters worth of notes in japanese just of things that i thought while i was reading Mm -hmm. i was gonna write a review but it's just too it's just too unwieldy but there's just so much information that I that you get from it after you actually live here for a significant period, and it's like it's way different. Like you're seeing something completely different than you would have otherwise. It's really interesting. Very cool. Uh, all right. Next question. Uh, this one's for me around Anki. I've been talking for a while about um Anki micro steps. Uh, or or rather, somebody in my Discord brought it up. No Compo, who was a contributor on um, I guess he probably still is a contributor on. Morphman and some other tools that are out there. Um, but he mentioned that uh, one of the ways that he increased his retention for newer cards was by doing a lot of little steps before um, before considering them graduated. Uh, so that was something that uh, I mentioned I would try, and I've been doing it for, I don't know, six months. Um, I think I'll probably do a more in-depth video, maybe even with him later on, because uh, he's got quite a bit of insights about the algorithm and different options there. Um, so I guess to keep this short for you, um, it, that's still a work in progress. Uh, if you are interested in the micro steps, like I would say just go ahead and try it. Like I didn't know what effect it would have on Anki if I did it. Um, and all it did was it's, it's more steps, but it doesn't really feel like less time because, or doesn't feel like more time you're spending in Anki because it's a lot of shorter ones uh, faster. So because you're seeing it more often, you can typically recall it faster. So um, that's that's what I've seen, and it does seem like it increased my retention. But the bigger thing that increased my retention was just dropping the interval modifier. So I I think that's probably the best bang for your buck if you're dealing with that. Um, the other thing is I also after the Doth uh, interview started doing Anki twice in a day, uh, like like you mentioned you do Doth, and uh, also same same thing there because I had already been uh, already seen the cards that I missed. Doing that in the second part of the day, those cards go so fast because you've already seen them. Um, so doing a lot of little steps in between there 
uh, it's like less than 10 minutes to do all the cards that I've, I've missed, which is pretty reasonable. Are you still keeping up with that, Doth? You do twice a day or what's what's the case? Yeah, I still do twice a day, unless like exam weeks, I honestly mm -hmm. do less Anki and that kind of hurts me, mm -hmm. but I can like catch them up like during the holidays, so. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, let's see. So the next one is for Ham Slice and Doth from uh, IOG. So favorite Japanese media that you feel is underappreciated or underrated? Ham Slice, you got anything for that one? Um, underrated, huh? I think that Japanese drama is underrated, to be honest with you. Bold claim. I think. I don't think. I don't think so. I think that a lot of times when we download and like watch and then discuss Japanese shows, it's not like it's not really like a comprehensive look at what is out there. So like when I was staying with my father-in-law or my ex-father-in-law now for those last three months of my stay in Japan, we would watch TV and I was watching with him and he knew already what was good. And I liked pretty much everything that I was watching with him. Like we watched like Jidaigeki, we watched like just like tons of stuff and we'd get like wasted on whiskey or whatever. And just like, like eating like just like Japanese snacks and just being blasted out of our minds watching like shows from like the eighties. And those are good. Like I, I have no complaints whatsoever. So, I mean, like just, it's like, it's like we, we assume that anime is going to be good. So we watch more of it and then we just throw out what we don't like. We try like three dramas and we're like, okay, hey, this is all bullshit. And then we don't try again. You should do the same thing. You should try lots. There's a lot of good stuff out there. I think that it, it bears looking into. I've, I've watched quite a handful of dramas at this point, and I tried talking to one of my Japanese friends about it, and they were like, yeah, I, I hate Japanese dramas. So I, <laughs> I guess I asked the wrong person. They were like, yeah, uh, all the budgets are way lower. Hollywood films are better. It's like, yeah. And it's sometimes, sometimes the acting is just absolutely atrocious in Japanese dramas. But I have found quite a few gems, and I've talked about them on the show before. Um, what about uh so that's that's underappreciated uh it, for, from ham slice anything from you doth any underappreciated media yeah okay this is going to be a weird answer i think because i also kind of recently got into this from a very uh cute obasan friend actually sadly she's married so but <laughs> uh, that medium yeah uh is youtube tutorials or like tutorials on real life mm. so for example tutorials on like cooking or like i don't know how to clean a car for example how to call for like if your electricity goes out and i think these are simple real life things but these are things that i actually can't think of like the instructions or like when i actually saw them i learned how to uh i don't know do do them essentially because mm -hmm. like it, it it feels as like very obvious but since i've never done them in japanese it's like a new experience for me. Like even, I don't know, uh, cooking an egg, I don't know, like sunny side up. How would you explain that in Japanese? Or how would you mm -hmm. like listen to instructions and do that? Because in English, it's like super easy, you know, crack an egg, blah, blah, blah. And so, yeah, that was a new experience for me. And I think that might be underappreciated, actually. That's a good one. Uh, let's see. So this one's uh, for me from Klein. Did you, finish, <laughs> did you finish reading Muramasa since the last interview? No, I dropped it. Uh, why did I drop it? Uh, I thought it was really good. I thought it was really interesting. But uh, I took like a couple month break when my retention was dropping significantly with Anki. Um, and Muramasa has a bunch of words, as well as I was reading Arslan Senki, which also has a bunch of words that I didn't know. Um, so between those two is like, well, I'm not even able to, I'm not learning these new words fast enough. And I don't feel like I have a big enough um, vocabulary to... Uh, really appreciate it that doesn't mean that within the next year like i won't i won't pick it up again but i'll probably do a couple other things in between there i've already started adding a bunch of cards and anki again so with that uh and reading things that uh, are more like stepping stones in between there i think uh I, I mean i'm looking forward to getting back into it with muramasa uh so for ham slice from swaggy uh when your when your japanese got good was there uh was there anything that you realized wasn't as good as you originally thought okay i think i kind of touched on this a few times already with like writing kanji 
like you know writing organized output for like essays and stuff like that but the, the really the really big thing was that just like the jump between like writing like a paragraph online in Japanese and having like no mistakes and feeling epic and that's like the like sometimes some people even think that that's like the ideal like you know thing be like okay that person can do that they're like you know masters now but then you go out there and you do that once and that's like your 100 best then you realize that japanese people do that when they're half asleep <laughs> and then they start like trouncing you and everything and you're like god damn so you like grind and so yeah i guess that's that's what it is like when i realized the time that when i real what the point of time in time that i realized i wasn't as good as i thought it was was the time that were the times that i had to compete directly with japanese people in japanese ability essentially and that is no joke that's not even like like that's not even close like okay so like if it's like a job interview or whatever that's fine because you're not necessarily looking at just your, your language ability but if you're looking at something that can only really like an at like like i said like the law school entrance exam or something like that where they like dock you points for incorrect like word order or like they don't give you full points if you miss kanji or something like that like when you get into that kind of like area things stop being funny and you stop being epic very quickly you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i i think i think the question this specific part of the question was going more for was there anything that once you got into like you know okay th something that you really liked maybe before like you've heard about oh. people that like anime and then they're like oh right. well now i know japanese and i hate anime and why have I learned Japanese? Oh, what did I? Okay, I thought it. I thought it. I thought it said, "When did I think I wasn't as good?" Okay, that was a good answer too. But yeah, visual <laughs> novels. Question. Visual novels. Visual novels. Okay. Okay. okay, so I used to think they were really, really fun and excellent, and I thought, okay, maybe, maybe they're like young adult novels type things, and they you know epic words or whatever. But I tried to read some stuff with the VN challenge, and I I reread stuff, but instead of feeling like it was like directed at like a younger audience it felt like it was literally written by like a 16 year old who never read a novel in his life and i was like god damn this is garbage and i just stopped reading them all together so don't don't at me about visual novels anymore wow okay <laughs> damn that is very controversial <laughs> yeah <laughs> djt is about to have an internal crisis okay whatever i'll just block them all <laughs> damn. yeah i mean for me that's like the exact opposite though because like i never got into visual novels i never knew about them until i learned japanese and so I always thought, wow, this is such a cool medium. I don't know, maybe in like five years' time, I might have the same opinion. But at least for now, I still love visual. So. Okay, interesting. I think they're good for learning. I think they're fantastic. But like you get to a point where it's just like, ooh, this is kind of, yeah. <sighs> okay, so uh, last miscellaneous question. I don't think we covered this one uh, on your interview, Doth. But how, how did you come across um, the Japanese learning communities that you ended up being involved with and specifically the one people are always interested in is DJT. Yeah, so I think the first thing I found was Itazura Neko, I think was like the old, very old uh, cornucopia of resources, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then in one of them, it linked to the, uh, what do you call it? The QM can Anki card thingy, mm -hmm. whatever. And then I read the guide, it turns out there's a Discord server. I went into the Discord server. At the time, it was still N5, like the entry quiz. Hmm. And I was scared. I, did, I could not pass N5. <laughs> I was already in Japan, right? I took N5 in Japan. Mm -hmm. I very giddy giddy. I passed N5. Mm. And so I also passed in the server, right? And that's how I first came into contact with DJT. And then like one year after, I took N1. So I think that's mm. a very nice story. Mm. You know, doing N5, getting into DJT, one year after getting N1. So. That's pretty good. Um. Yeah, they, they also asked uh, what my experience was, and uh, I found it the same way, anime cards, uh, and I specifically asked Quizmaster uh, to come on the show. He said, oh, ESL, not going to do it, or maybe later is what he said. <laughs> and then actually after the Ham Slice interview, I did get, he did allow me to have a five-minute interview with him on uh, VC chat. And if you missed it, that little piece of history, uh, I died right then because uh, it, there was no recording. But uh, it was fun, Quizmaster. Uh, so, Last question. Saigo no shutsumon. So, Nihongo de umaku deki na kata kara, nani ka hazukashi hanashi ga arimasu ka? So, saisho boku desu, tsugi wa dosan, saigo wa hamsurai san. Ja, boku no hashi. So, 2020 nen sangatsu datta, eto, roku gatsu gurai, nihon ni sundeita. Eto, nihon no kaisha de, sono toki ni, zutto, 
会社で最後の日だったから、僕の最後の日だったから、えっ、ー、と、部門のチームとあ飲み会に行った。その、そこで、選別をもらった。あ、えっ、ー、と、綺麗な木箱ですね。えっ、ー、とあ、中身は何でしょうかと思ったあそ。その、その時に拾った。えっ、ー、と、ああ、お箸セット、綺麗ですね。えっ、ー、と、この、この箸、な、えっ、ー、と、カタカナで、漢字とと、あ書いてありました。あ、二つ、二つのセットもありますね。あ、つまの名も、あ書いてありました。あ、だから、たけしさんがつまの名を聞きました。なるほど、なるほど。そんな感じでした。えっ、ー、と、その箱の、蓋の正面に、えっ、ー、と、漢字が彫られた。えっ、ー、と、読もうと思ったけど、その時に漢字をしっかり忘れてしまった。えー、感動、かつ、なんだこれが。呆然としながら、皆さんじっと見つめた。誰かが、あ、感謝です。えそんな簡単な言葉読めない。6月ぐらい日本に住んでいた。一緒に<笑>仕事していたけど、そんな簡単なこと。現実の言葉クイズ、失敗しました。えっ、ー、と、それに、えっ、ー、と、Slack というのアプリは、えっ、ー、とね、Discord のようなメッセージを配信。するアプリですね。その会社でずっとその、その、えー、アプリを使いました。僕が一番よく使った文字は、そ,その会社でたくさんたくさん、えー、別の話ですが、絵文字、カスタムな絵文字がたくさんたくさんありました。えっ、ー、と、僕が一番よく使った絵文字は、やっぱ漢字で書いた感謝でした。けど、その時に、えっ、ー、と、みんながじっと忘れちゃった。えっ、ー、と、最後の印象だろう。えー、だから日本から出た。最,最後の冗談だ,だけど、そんなのこと。最後の印象。<笑>うん、じゃあ、ドッさん、もっと恥ずかしいお話をお願いします。はい、じゃあ、僕の方からなんですけど、正直、あの、一応、その一行の実験っていうか、あの失敗話はあるんですけれども、それほどまだ考えてはいないので、ちょっと臨機応変で説明させていただきます。あの、ちょうど2ヶ月前では、あの、通訳の頼みがあったんですけどね、あの、一応、皆さん、あのご存知の通りだと思うんですけれども、僕は今年の4月から、えっ、ー、と、インドネシアの留学生協会の、えー、総会会長になっております。その仙台支部なんですけど、仙台の、まあ、宮城支部の管轄の中にも入ってるんですけど、でそうすると、あの東北地方の,あの中心にある宮城県なので、一応、東北の代表でもなっております。というわけで、あのまあ、水薬とかあの入国管理業務とかの話で、あのパスポート、ビザ、いろいろあの、まあ、あの日本語で、えっと、民間というか、インドネシアの方を、手伝おうとしていますでその中には特にあの夏休み、まあ、僕の夏休みなんですけど、えっと、インドネシアの方は大体、引越しとか退去の話が結構多いんですね。で、その中には特に僕のアパートからかなり近い方で、あの退去え、そうです、退去したい方がいて、あのそのなんていう、最終のチェックの確認について、と,、えー、と契約書のいろいろなところをちょっと確認させていただいてほしいと言われたんですけれども、で、あの立ち会いの時には、正直僕はそれほど、まあ、難なくっていうより、あのまあ、なんとなくできたんですけど、特には一つの言葉にかなりあのこだわりがあって、その,、まあ、その言葉のせいだからって、えー、と勘違いされちゃってるんですね。で、その勘違いこそが自分にとってはかなり恥ずかしい。でありますというのはあの皆さん
、えっと、平米っていう言葉なんですけど、その時は自分がぼーっとしていて、平米の意味は何でしょうって自分に何回聞かせても、あの、あんまり浮かんでないっていうか、思いつかなかったんですよね。検討もしかなかったんですけど、で、あの、一応、そのチェックの中には、えー、と換気とかエアコンとか冷蔵庫とか、えー、と電気、水道と,、えー、と壁の話ですね。壁、このかなり重要な話なんですけど、壁にはあ,のある程度汚れとかカビがついてあるので、えーと、そのカビにはキーミングしないといけないんですよね。で、そのカビがあの一面と言わ,る言われてるんですけど、その一面が平米で、あの計算されてるんですねでも自分が「平米」ってどういうことどういう言葉ってまだあのはっきり思い出せないのでその時には「あれ平米?」漢字は「平」「平」と「米」「平」はおそらく平「平」「平たい」「平」「平」「平」「米」って何だろうって思ったんですけど「米」はあの米とかじゃないかなと思ってあアメリカっていうイメージも意味もあるんですけどでちなみにあの管理会社の方がえー、と2人ですね。1人は、えー、とアメリカ、まあ、ハーフで、えーと、ハーフもアメリカと日本人なので、英語もおそらくできるとは思ったんですけど、結局、日本語にあのしたんですけどね。で、あの両,両方というか、あの一方の方も日本人なんですけど、あんまりあのお話は聞いたなかったんですけどね、そのまあ彼からは。で、あの一応、その管理会社の方の、まあ、アメリカ人からは、えっと、この壁はあの一応クリーニングしないといけないんですけど、一面平米は、まあ、一平米はその、えっと、1500円になりますっていう話。でも自分は平米っていう言葉はまだ全然思いつかないから、あれ、平米って結局何の意味だろうか。でも、その彼からは、えっと、自分は日本語できそうと見えるので、別に。あのなんて聞こうともしないんですよね。あのその日本人、日本人っていうか、まあ、アメリカ人の方なんですけど。で、自分も、あのなんていう、平米はかなり簡単な言葉じゃないかなと思ってしまうので、別にあの聞かなくてもいいんじゃないかなと。で、あのインドネシアの方にある程度、あまあ、主役して、であのまあ、相談とか面談、面談っていうか、あのまあ、いろいろな話なんですけど。で、その、なんていう、平米の方、平米の言葉を思い出す、まあ、しようとしながら、その、にあのアメリカ人の方をあの、ちょっと騙そうとしますね。というのは、あの契約書の中に、とんでもない話とか、とんでもないあの質問をしていて、例えばね、あの、実はペットは禁止されてるんですけれども、例えばの話なんですけど、えっと、もし、野良猫とか野良犬が、まあ、あの急にできたらっていうかあのアパートに入っちゃうのであればそれも自己負担になりますかとか、まあ、そういう話みたいで、えー、っと結局は30分が経ってしまってあの平米は、まあ、僕その時はあの漢字2級も一応合格したんですよねだからその自己投資っていうか自己なんだろうあのこの簡単な言葉が分からないっていうか思い出せないっていうのはやっぱり恥ずかしいでしょうね。恥があったんですよね。で、あの結局、自己解釈で、平は平たいね。平。で、米はアメリカ。なので、セントラルアメリカっていう意味なんじゃないかなと思っちゃったんですよね。だから、あのまあ、一応、全部が終わって、えー、その管理会社の方があのこうやっていたんですね。じゃあ、えー、っと、カーベンが、えー、っと、まあ、合計として、一、うん、面平米、一平米で、あの、五千になりますっていう。あ、はい。で、あの、僕がちょっとバカのあまりで、あの、本当にこれなんだろうって思っちゃったんですけど、あ、そうですね、平米ですね、あの、北米とか南米じゃないんですよね。言っちゃったんですよね。で、そのカレンが、んあれあの、君何か言ったんですかって、みたいな感じで、ちょっと、あの、疑心暗鬼で、あれほ、北米南米あ,は,あはいはいあのへへ平米ですねはいそのこちらは1面なので2面3面となるとはい5000円ですよねとかみたいな感じででカレンが
いや、すみません、その1面とは言ったんですけれども、あの1平米は1500になるので、これは横がおそらくあのおよそ5メートルで、高さが3メートルなので、あの15平米になりますね。というわけでは、えー、20万か30万になってしまうかもしれないんです。まあ、見積もりとしては。で、その時は自分が悟ってしまうんですよね。あそうなんだ。平米って結局、あの、あなんていう。スクエアメーターの英語って言うんですけれども、あ、そうなんだ。あ、そっか、平米。で、その時は、恥ずかしい。やっぱり、その、自分が、あれ、北米、南米ってどういう話結局ね。自分の進行回路をね、もう、実験性みたいな、あの、黄金時代に戻ったみたいに、な,なんだろうね。あの、必死に考えとしても、逆に、本当簡単な言葉で、あの、ありました。というわけで、あの、見積もりが終わった後に、まあ、見積もり書とか、まあ、請求書をもらったんですけど、で、その、ちょっと下の方で、あの、なんていう、えぇ、ー、小文字で、あの、次回はもっと日本語が堪能でいらっしゃる方をお願いした方がいいと思います。っていう話でした。いやー。あ、いいです。<笑>えっと、<笑>アムサイさん。お願いします、はいえー、日本語の失敗話ですね。うん、えー、っと、僕も,もう日本語を勉強し始めてから何回も何回も何回も何回も失敗し続けてきたから、ちょっとえ選びづらかったんだけど、あの、今日話すのは、えー、っと、学部1年生の,の時の話で、あの、導入演習っていう授業あので発表があった時の話になります。えっと、この発表、あ、授業、この授業は、あの、まあ、論理学だったりとか、あの、法思想史だとか、あの、法学を勉強する上で、あの、基本となるような、あの理解力っていうかあの分析力を養うための授業であのこうあの参加している学生全員にあの全員に、えーっとまあ、発表させたりとか討論させたりしてあのこう分析力を高めるものだったんですよ。であの一週間目の時に、あの、一週間目っていうか、そう。一週間目からもう、あの、発表することが決められていて、あの、二週間目から僕がもう発表あったんですよ。論理学に関する発表。<笑>で、それまでは論理学を勉強したこと一回もなくて、で発表の内容もなかなか決められなかったんですよね。で、先生のオフィスアワーに参加して、やっと、やっと決めたら、あの早速あの、まあ、調べ物したりとかあの、スライドの作成したりしたんだけど、やっぱりあのちょっとあの理解力が。不完全で、あの、うまく整理できなかったんですよね。あのどうしても<笑>。こう、一週間のうちにできることは限られてるじゃないですか。だから、結構大変で、でも、やっとのことで、あの、スライドだけは完成させて、あの、発表の当日に、もう、こう、教壇に登って、発表しようとしたんですよね。ただ、あの、やっぱり、こうスライドにまとめられてある情報と自分の頭の中でもうまとまってる情報って結構違っててあの要はあの十分な学習がで,きなかできてなかったっていうことなんだけどあのでスライドにまとめられてたのはこうあのテ,キストかテキストからあのコピペしたりとかこう軽くまとめたものでそれを発表の場でこう僕が解説するみたいな感じになるはずが
あのただひたすらスライドに書いてあるものを読み上げてで終わった感じなんですよねあのちょっとこうあのそれぞれの論点というかあのをうまくこう自分の言葉で説明できなくてでその結果としてあの他の学生聞き手にとってはものすごく分かりづらいものになってしまったんですよ。で最後の,あの質疑応答の時にあの他の学生からの質問は一切なかったっていうのがあっていうことになってしまってそれで先生からあの<笑>ちょっと苦笑いされてあの何も伝わってないっていうのが分かったんですよ。だから結構ね大変だったんですよその大変っていうかその,その場の僕の気持ちはものすごく複雑であのまずはあの自分のこうなんだろう理解力が十分でなかったりとかこう発信力も十分不十分でこう相手が僕の言葉からどれぐらい理解できるのかっていうのがあまり理解できてなくてそれまでの学習はあくまでも自分の理解力を前提としてやってきたっていうのを急に実覚させられてそれをちょっとかみしめながらあのこう静かな教室の前で立ってたのが恥ずかしかったんですよね恥ずかしいっていうかう結構悔しい思い出になりましたね。Well, there you go, guys. You finally got some output.、Um, that's, that, that brings us to the end of the podcast.、Uh, Doth Ham Slice, thanks so much for sharing some embarrassing memories. I guess we have to do shout outs. Oh, yeah. You guys got some shout outs you need to share. Okay. Shout out, Grug,、um, <laughs> Kamata, Swaggy, since you guys are on my back.、Um, no shout out to Ouch because he made Grug do it. Boom. <laughs> Uh, I already shout out to、yeah. him before, so no, it's fine. He got his birthday shout he out. He got、so. a dedicated one, and for some reason now I'm blocked by him. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I don't know what I did, but ouch, I miss you. <laughs> Let me back into ouch cord.、Um, also, Roshi is now the third, third descendant of the scat guys on DJT, apparently. So, Roshi, congratulations on your、uh, promotion. <laughs> All right,、um, and that wraps it up. Don't know when the next one will be, but hope you guys enjoyed this one. Thanks again, Doth Ham Slice.、Uh, where can people find you guys online?、Uh, Ham Slice.、Um, I'm just usually on the DJT server. I'm just hanging out.、Um, I don't usually answer Twitter DMs, like I said before. So if you want to find me, that's where I am, I guess. Okay. And、yeah. Doth, how about you? Same on Discord, Doth5403. I mean, if you ever find me, On my real life account, you can follow me, I guess, but I probably won't respond. so. And if they find you in real life, they can also follow you, right, Doth? Yes.、Uh, I, talk to me. Don't follow me. <laughs> I would be happy to have a drink. All right. Very cool. All right. Thanks, guys, so much. You guys can find me at Kanji Eater. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye.